Hey guys, it's Sandro here, and welcome to part two of the detail on this Nesson Pulsar VZR N1 Spec 2. In part one, I went through the wash and decontamination steps to get the car ready for both paint correction and various coatings. And I'm going to jump straight into part two by ceramic coating the inner wheel wells. So after giving these wheel wells a good thorough clean and removing decades of built up grime, hopefully you guys can see just how great they've come up. So the idea with the ceramic coating is that it's going to really help keep them cleaner by not allowing road contamination to bond and build up so easily. And when it comes to cleaning them during a maintenance wash, the owner will find that they are super easy to clean and maintain. So my first step is to do a final panel wipe with Shine Supply Throwback that's going to remove any dust, lingering grime or chemical residue to ensure I get the best possible bond with the coating. I'm using NV Wheel to ceramic coat the wheel wells, which is a great durable heat and chemical resistant coating, especially made for these areas. But as you'll hopefully see, it does have a fantastic saturation and darkening effect on all the various trims and components. So it additionally really makes the whole area look crisp, clean and pop a little more. I'm using a foam hand applicator to apply it, which I prefer for wheel wells and wheel areas. Dabbing it into a section at a time and then working it over that area for a couple of minutes to ensure I've got a good consistent coverage. Now as I've mentioned in past videos, the only reason I wipe or level down ceramic coatings is to get a clean streak free finish. So in areas like wheel wells and other certain textured finishes, you can get a streak free finish without wiping the coating down which is ideal as you can retain a thicker layer and more durable outcome if you don't need to wipe the coating down. And I'd also recommend applying two layers of the coating on each wheel well about two hours apart if you're going to go to all the trouble of cleaning and preparing the wheel wells as in my experience a second coat can give you up to 50% more durability. Next was the car rims. Now I can tell you that just after a good wheels off clean and claying them, they already look so much better and brighter, but I could definitely still see some oxidation, road stains, and quite a few swirls that a decent polish should address and really get them looking their best. I started off doing a test section in the inner wheel barrel using my DA polisher with a microfiber pad and medium grade compound which actually worked a treat to lift that oxidation, clean off some of those more stubborn stain marks and remove the vast majority of the swirls and scratches. Once the inner wheel barrels were completed, I then started on the wheel face. 
For this, I switched to my smaller two inch polisher so that I had a bit more reach into those more intricate areas of the outer rims, which worked really well. Not all car rims are the same, so some with more basic designs aren't too bad to polish, while others are a bit of a nightmare and just massively time consuming to polish to a high standard. But overall, this is quite a laborsome job in general, and I'd say each rim took me a good 45 minutes to an hour or so to polish to the standard I was happy with. Next up was ceramic coating the rims to protect and enhance the finish as well as make them much easier to clean in the future. As you'll see I also used Nova Wheel to coat the rims using the same basic method of initially spreading the coating all over the area on one side of the wheel then working the coating for a good couple of minutes to get a good consistent coverage. Now on a gloss painted surface you really have to level down the coating unlike on the wheel wells. And since Nova Wheel is a rather quick flashing coating, you can wipe it down almost instantly after you've applied it, unless it is fairly cold, in which case you should give it a minute or two. And just like the wheel wells, I also gave each rim a second coat about 90 minutes to two hours later to increase its durability and also enhance the gloss and look of the finish. The last step was dressing the tyres in which I used NV Onyx, working it in for a good minute or two that left a beautiful deep black satin finish to contrast with the bright white alloy rims. 
and her white is a very hard colour to capture on camera. But I just couldn't have been more happy with how the wheels turned out so crisp and clean and really popped once placed over the rich glowing wheel wells which we'll have a look at in the last chapter of this series in the final finished shots of the car. The next area was finishing up the engine bay. Now as I mentioned in part 1, the owner really just wanted the engine rocker cover cleaned up, but I decided to do the whole engine bay instead to take you guys through that process. It may be hard to see on camera, but the metal lettering on the rocker cover was a little oxidised and faded, so I used a metal polish with a microfiber pad and my TA50 polisher to lift that haziness off the lettering. Now I did try a few more things, but there were a few deeper corrosion spots in the lettering that would require sanding to remove them. But that would also remove the original machined textured finish on the lettering, which I know is something the owner didn't want. So it's not something I pursued, and it's okay in my opinion to leave that patina in place rather than altering the way the manufacturer finished a particular trim or part. Next was polishing the paint on the rocker cover. Now in some areas I could already see that the clear coat was quite thin and the base coat was starting to come through. So I didn't want to make it any worse but rather just restore some gloss and clarity to the finish. I did initially try using a finer polish and pad to correct it but it just had no impact meaning that it seemed to be a harder paint on the rocker cover. In the end I used NV Precision Compound with the Lake Country Fiber Cutting Pad to remove the haze and amplify gloss and clarity but just stuck to one pass in each area to limit the aggression which worked really well and was a great balance of being safe but still effective to restore the paint.
Now I didn't go crazy and start removing parts and polishing everything in the engine bay because I simply didn't have the time. But I did decide to polish a few extra parts in the engine bay while I was there to also show you guys that given the time, you can do more than just clean and dress an engine bay and polishing is actually a great way to deep clean stained, painted or gloss surfaces to get them looking much better. The last step was dressing the engine bay. I do really like CarPro Pearl for engine bays and for things like older rubbers and plastics you can only do so much cleaning them and a good dressing and protectant correctly applied will dramatically help restore their new factory finish. Just try to concentrate on one small area of the engine bay at a time and spend a decent amount of time really massaging the dressing into each surface to help it bond and have a nice uniform finish. You can really apply it to almost any material including rubbers, plastics, metals and even painted trims. I'll also mention that you can clean certain rubbers till the cows come home but they will still transfer black residue on your application pad so it's normal and actually a sign that the rubber still contains the vital oils it needs so it won't crack and dry up. Once the whole engine bay has been done, give the dressing a good hour or two to soak in and bond. After that, it's really important in my opinion to grab a cloth and level down any excess dressing which firstly gives you a nicer satin factory finish rather than a less natural glossier finish. And secondly, it's important to remove the excess dressing as it will prevent dust and dirt from building and accumulating. The surface shouldn't feel greasy if you've done this process right and given the dressing time to soak in and then level it down properly. But hopefully you guys will see what a fair few hours of work can really do to transform an engine bay into something you just love looking at.
The final area in this video was the interior detail. Now, as mentioned in part one, this was really only meant to be a quicker interior tidy up. And although I didn't go completely nuts, I did try to make it a more elaborate interior detail for this video and basically just take you guys through my general process. Firstly is removing any rubbish, personal items, car mats or really anything that's going to get in the way. When I'm cleaning delicate trims like parcel shelves or headliners, I try to avoid touching them as much as possible and just use blown air, a light brush or even light steam to clean them as past experience has shown me that they are just too fragile to clean as you would most other interior materials. The original car mats in this Nissan were truly pristine and beautiful. It's actually a real shame that we tend to get crappy felt these days instead of real carpet like these ones. But in any case, they were in great condition and wouldn't take too much work to clean them up. Now overall, the interior of this car really wasn't all that dirty. It was mostly a layer of dust and some light dirt that needed removing to start with. This is what I call my dry cleaning stage, which is basically vacuuming and dusting the whole interior from top to bottom. I actually spend quite a bit of time here as my goal with this initial dry cleaning stage is to remove 95% plus of all the loose dust, dirt and particles within the cabin before moving on to the next wet cleaning stage. If I had to make one critique about a lot of interior videos I see is that a lot of them seem to jump straight into hand brushing or even machine brushing and steaming and extracting the surfaces while there's still a lot of dust, dirt and particles in the interior. I understand that it's quite satisfying to see that loose grime mix in with brushes or extract up into machines on videos from a longevity point on the interior materials, you need to understand that you're not doing the car any favors by grinding all those looser particles, which act like sanding abrasives on the fabric, leather, plastics, and other trims. Ultimately, you're prematurely wearing down the interior cabin trims if you don't do a good, thorough dry clean before you even think about moving onto a wet clean. And additionally, your cleaning chemicals just aren't going to work as well if they have to fight through all that looser dirt before they can get to the embedded grime beneath. Next was the wet cleaning stage. As many of you may know, I do really like CarPro Insight as a total interior cleaner, and I mostly use it at a one-to-one -one dilution, unless the interior is quite bad, in which case I'll use it neat. But the two main tools I use to apply it are a standard detailing brush and the CarPro in a scrub glove. I generally like to apply my interior chemicals directly to my brush or glove which avoids chemical etchings or stains which can occur when you spray cleaners directly on trims. But apart from that, I work in a general top to bottom pattern around the interior, focusing on a small section at a time and using a microfiber cloth to wipe the trim down after cleaning. Personally, I find that the inner scrub glove is just so much faster, yet completely safe on most trims. But there's still a few areas where a small brush works better. So the combination of these two basic interior cleaning tools works perfectly for me. And I'll flush out my brush after every couple of sections, turn the inner scrub glove over, and once it's dirty, I'll switch to a new one or clean it out as I need to.
Now when it comes to fabric seats and carpets, my general procedure is to be a little more liberal with my cleaner, as it does help. And then use the inner scrub glove to give them a good thorough scrub down. What actually happens is that the glove tends to lift off and hold most of the surface grime, unlike a brush that tends to leave it on the seat. And that's one of the biggest differences between using the inner scrub glove. It not only breaks down the dirt, but also removes it. I notice this even more so now when I use my hot water extractor, as I just don't see the same amount of grime being pulled up from the seats because it's already been removed and it actually seems to cut my extraction time in half, which is great. Once all the interior has been wet cleaned from top to bottom, my next step was cleaning the glass. For this I like to use short pile or loop thread microfiber cloths that firstly don't tend to lint as much and secondly don't tend to bunch up and be too grabby on the glass. I'm using CarPro Clarify as my glass cleaner which is a great product, spraying it on liberally and then using a first cloth to work it in, making sure I clean well around the edges, and then a second cloth to get a perfect streak-free finish. My advice with glass, besides using a good cleaner and some good towels, is to be generous with the amount of glass cleaner as it does help. Use two cloths and make sure they are super clean and just used for glass. And lastly, use a bit of elbow grease and don't be afraid to wipe that glass down with a bit of aggression as you're not going to hurt the glass and sometimes when the glass is quite dirty, it needs it.
The final step was protecting the vinyl, plastics and leather trims with a durable interior coating. I really like Envy Guardian as an interior coating because it creates no gloss but adds a nice amount of saturation to recondition the trims, can last well up to a year and is super easy and nice to apply. And because it's water based, there's no horrible solventy smell. I'm just using the micro suede side of my Tide applicator to apply it, putting a little more on to start with to prime the applicator and then basically just massaging it into every surface minus the fabrics and glass. For the most part, Guardian will self-level on the surface as long as you work it in reasonably well. But what I usually do is coat the whole interior and then come back with a microfiber cloth to level down any high spots here or there or any excess coating that needs a wipe down. I also applied a second coat about an hour later and within about 2-3 to three hours the coating is good to go as it's also a rather quick curing coating. Now I'm going to preempt a couple of questions I always seem to get whenever I put up an interior detailing video. The first one being, why didn't I remove the seats? The answer is something my high school shop teacher always used to tell me, which is kiss or keep it simple stupid. If there's a reason I need to remove the seats, such as a kid throwing up between the front and rear seats, which is a couple of past jobs I've had, or just some stains I can't get to with the seats in place, I will remove them, but for the most part I've been doing this long enough to be able to clean around the seats exceptionally well, so it's just an added step I don't feel is necessary or beneficial for the majority of jobs. Secondly is why do I do the interior before paint correction? I personally don't like having to pull vacuum extractor or steamer cords in and out of the cabin after I've spent days correcting and coating the paint. And I additionally don't like having dust, water, steam and chemicals making their way through the air onto the car paint after I've corrected it, which is pretty much my main reasoning. I usually do another quick vacuum and dust before I hand the car over to the owner anyway, which will sort out any dust entering the interior during the paint correction process. Lastly is why don't I use a drill or machine driven cleaning brush? The simple answer is because I don't need to. Almost everything I do in relation to detailing is always about using the least aggressive method that works. So if I don't need to use a more aggressive spinning brush, I simply won't. Now I certainly use these brushes from time to time when needed, but they're not something I immediately pull out every time. The other reason is that they do tend to splatter chemicals around the interior so they can be messy and cause chemical stains. I know it's sometimes hard, but you really need to judge your work or results in two vital areas. So firstly is judging the safety. Are you causing any damage to the surface you've cleaned? Now obvious damage such as tears, discoloration, chemical stains and deeper scratches are easy to spot. But other damage occurs over time, like drying out materials, slowly fading or wearing them down so that they become more brittle or very light scuffs and wear marks that aren't immediately obvious but do become clear over time with repeated use of bad or overly harsh chemicals and techniques. Secondly is judging the cleanliness and finish result. So is the surface truly clean? Most of us know by now that a badly detailed interior is usually covered in greasy dressings, left wet to cover up or hide stains, and blasted with cheap air fresheners to give the appearance of a clean interior cabin. It can be debatable, but in my opinion a clean interior should firstly be dry. The trims and materials should look as close to factory new as possible, and not be glossy or greasy. And although it's fine to use a nice, subtle air freshener, it shouldn't be an overwhelming and all-encompassing smell. All I'm trying to say is that we all have different ways of approaching different aspects of detailing. These videos are about me showing you my way, but results are what really matter, and if the methods used are safe and respectful towards the vehicle you're working on, and if they are effective at achieving the goal and outcome, then you've done a good job no matter how you went about it. I hope you guys stay tuned for part 3, which will be the all time consuming paint correction step and the bulk of the work that went into this job. As always, I really hope you guys enjoyed and found this video useful. 
please share this video, like, comment, and subscribe to this channel to show your support for this content, and I'll see you guys soon. This is life in the bad days, bad days Forget about the reason, reason Don't know what you're doing, doing But try to catch the feelings, feelings You make